Perhaps the one caution we will have learned over the past six months is that we will probably never use casually again the phrase going viral. The unpredictability of the coronavirus has brought our known world to a sharp halt and in so many ways to a brisk standstill. Not only is the future unknown, the present is unknown. And we are trying to piece together once again the past from the fragments that remain to us. The last thing we want is for anything to be going viral again anytime soon. We probably, I'd suggest, have had enough of the word viral for the present. Now the future is the unknown, as indeed it always was going to be. The variables are greatly magnified since the onset of the coronavirus. But in many ways, the lockdown was perhaps easier to handle than the relaxation of restrictions, because we thought that our withholding and our withdrawing were contributing something positive to the common good. We began to get our head and our tongue around phrases like this, staying together by staying apart, however extraordinary they may now seem to us. But they still hold, and they still hold firm. In those earlier days, we derived satisfaction from making our effort make a difference. The lockdown, of course, brought untold distress to some families, along with violence in the home. And this type of violence is a tragic violence and a violent tragedy. Yet the lockdown also brought the delight of being together for a sustained period of time to many others. The relaxation has been quite different because it has brought us face to face with personal responsibility for ourselves and for others. And yet we're not exactly sure what is meant by the phrase personal responsibility. We ourselves need to watch carefully where we are and what we are doing when we are there. Part of the reason that this is problematic is not only that we are sociable and gregarious creatures by nature, but it's because we're deprived of the predictability of the predictable itself. This is new territory to us, and some are making more of it than are others, as was bound to be the case. We live then in what we might call the land of the variables. Now, to take a different perspective, the shape of pastoral care is the unknown. While this is particularly raw and new for those being ordained, the situation we're in is equally raw and new for those who will never be ordained. Because the lockdown has some, done something positive and something different. It has brought to the fore neighborliness as a discipleship, as a ministry, and as an expression of humanity. Your status or mine within the church did not dictate our response to others or our receiving help, assistance, kindness from others. It was, therefore, and it proved to be, a great time of great inclusion. But there are specific challenges nonetheless for those who are to be ordained. How do you get your feet under the table, as people might say? Where do you begin to build specifically pastoral relationships with people you do not know? And equally important, how do they get the measure of you? Particularly if meeting them is now as problematic as it has become and is becoming more so. I've often thought that as clergy, we instinctively expect people to come to church and also that they probably see the flow of worship as very much how we as clergy shape it. They need surely 
to see how we perform on their patch, in their house, in their garden, talking to their dogs or indeed their cat. But this type of interchange is gone for the foreseeable future. And so we cannot but be forced to ask a question like this. What is the new dynamic of relationship between your space, their space, and my space? And the question runs deeper still. How is the church as an institution going to overcome or break through the barrier of social distancing and offer spiritual embrace without endangering those who pray for the church day after day. And there is a further question which some members of the Roman Catholic tradition in England are asking. Have people learned to be the church when they were not able to be in a church? A third area of the unknown would seem to me to be this. How are you as individuals embarking on a life of ordination, going to develop your own liturgical style in the confines of worship that can realistically take up little more than 35 or 40 minutes? Precisely because the church adapted almost overnight to the new situation of lockdown worship, people generally have come to like shorter services. You can give whatever explanation of this you care to. My own experience over the past number of weeks and months is that it takes a lot longer to construct a short act of worship than it does to allow a longer act of worship to unfold. We have a lot of work ahead of us to match needs and expectations and expectations and possibilities. And then, of course, there is the very obvious question. Having let anyone on the outside of the church building and of the particular church itself in, why would we want to put them out again? Are we not reminded, perhaps, of that overzealous Joshua, rushing up to the aged and experienced Moses and saying, Are you actually aware that Eldad and Medad are prophesying outside of the camp? And Moses replies as follows, I wish that all my people were prophets. It's no wonder that this is the Old Testament reading for Pentecost with Sunday. A fourth area of the unknown. And I have to tell you that in these days we are only started with the unknown. A fourth area I would suggest is this. How are people now going to have the time to engage with their rightful preoccupations, old and new, work-related and unemployment-related, family, friends and adversaries, and come to church, and participate in church-based activities. We are going to have to think and to talk all of these things through with them in new ways. Gathering and regulation come together in novel ways for you who are now to be ordained. Because you are the human face of the divine presence in a situation of constant grace and also of constant vigilance. You, along with those of us who have been ordained for a somewhat longer time, enter a sustained period of experimentation and response where a ministry of encouragement is our best option and indeed our true calling. But it also has to become once again a ministry with outcomes. If ever the question has upended itself, it certainly has done so now. No longer can the question be something like this, what can we do for them, without also being, what can they do for us? Because the people of the whole country and the people of the whole church have lived through somewhat cataclysmic times. Cataclysmic times 
that as yet have probably simply brushed the cassock tails of the church. We need to hear them tell their story of discipleship. We need to learn with them how it is now in order to construct how it will be for the future. This, I want to suggest to you, is new and exciting territory, but it's also difficult. 